I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jonathan Brown, who is a professor at Georgetown University. He received his doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the U University of Chicago in 2006. He specializes in the field of Hadith, and he has written a number of publications and articles and books. And I had mentioned this about Dr. Jackson once before, but with the emergence of this scholarship in English, we are seeing that just as Farsi, Urdu, Turkish, and all of these languages from various Muslim countries became great languages of Muslim civilization, now with the works of people like Dr. Brown and Dr. Jackson and others, that English is now a language of Islamic civilization. The topic today is hadith between Muslim conviction and criticism? And this is a, a question a lot of us may have. We talk about hadith. We may have our uncles that will talk about hadith in various ways critically. Or we may meet Muslims that have a, big, a lot of skepticism and a lot of non-Muslims that have skepticism about the hadith and the hadith sciences. And so inshallah, we will be talking about how do we navigate the divide between our unshakable convictions and the controversial dilemmas that arise from the Western studies and criticism of the prophetic hadith. So without further ado, Dr. Jonathan Brown. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billah min shaitan rajim bismillah rahman rahim Inna alhamdulillah lillah wa bihi nasta'een wa salatu wa salam ala rasul al uh, thanks very much for inviting me to, thanks to Zaytuna for inviting me to present today. And I'm happy that I don't want to sit on the chairs because I'm wearing outrageous socks, which would have been displayed had I been sitting down. Um, this, uh, I also feel bad because I'm fairly confident that I'm going to repeat some things that people have, some people have heard me say before. And I, I suppose I should apologize for that. But also, uh, I think it's some of the things that I'll repeat, I think are very important. So I'm not entirely contrite on this issue. The, uh, whenever I, I think about hadiths and when I talk about them to the students or to audiences, I always try to keep the, the words of a wise figure in my mind, a wise, not really a person, more of a creature, which is, of course, uh, Yoda from Star Wars. Not the later Star Wars movies where he's like a psychiatrist, the earlier ones where he's more dignified. Yoda, if anyone remembers from the early Star Trek movie, Star Wars movies, sorry, he, uh, he takes Luke Skywalker to this cave and um, Luke has to go into the cave as part of his training for to become a Jedi Knight. And Luke Skywalker asks Yoda, uh, what will I find in the cave? And Yoda says, only what you take with you only what you take with you. This is a very important point when we think about the past, when we think about history, and when we think about reading texts. When we think about reading things like the Quran or the Hadith or anything, um, when we look into the past, what we're really seeing is oftentimes more a reflection of ourselves than something about the text or about the past. We always see what our background programs us to see. This is very important because if you realize this, you realize that oftentimes the problems we encounter when we're doing things like reading hadiths or when we hear hadiths are, uh, occur because we've been programmed to think that there are certain universals that everybody agrees on. Like, for example, common sense. How many times have you heard someone say, well, that's just not common sense, or this hadith contradicts common sense? What is common sense? There's, no, there's no, actually no such thing as common sense. I mean, if you imagine a human being who's raised on a desert island with no culture, this person's not going to know anything about common sense. If you say, you know, the sky's above you and the earth's below you, yeah, the human being will know that. 
But so many other things that we think human beings just all agree on are actually just the uh, one particular culture or the conventions of one culture or of one class or of one part of a, of a society. And oftentimes, actually, uh, a lot of the biggest disagreements, especially in, in politics, have to do with conflicting common senses. Like, for example, uh, whether or not the government should uh, cut spending during a financial crisis or not. Everyone says it's common sense. You know, when you're sitting around your kitchen table, if you're having a financial crisis, well, you got to stop spending so much money. You got to you got to manage your budget. You got to cut down your spending. But when it comes to a government, a lot, no, most economists say no. You have to. The government has to spend more money to stimulate the economy. So this is an instance where common sense is actually wrong. And or for example, the idea that. Uh, in order to reduce population growth, you have to improve health care. Listen, that's not really common sense. You want pe more people to live longer, that's going to reduce population growth? Well, actually, from the perspective of development and statistics that groups like the Gates Foundation work on, they know very well that if you want to decrease population growth, you actually increase health care. I don't know how that works, it just does. These are instances in which what we think is common sense is actually just our own way of looking at the world, and it's not actually true. Why is this an important issue when we look at Hadith? It's very important because as the actual topic of this speech phrases it, I didn't actually pick the topic, but I'm very good, I'm very uh, happy that it was chosen this way because it demonstrates very clearly how the issue of Hadith is framed. There's Western, objective, rational, um, critical, neutral reading of hadith or analysis of hadith, and then there's the Muslim faith-based, fideistic, traditional method of hadiths, of looking at hadiths. And this is, uh, you know, m Muslims accept this. Muslims have kind of I integrated this into their own, their own worldview, and so they, they feel that as a Muslim, the way you look at hadiths is traditional, faith-based, versus the Western way, which is rational and critical. But as I, as I mentioned before, these descriptions of how people look at texts really tell you more about the people or their background, their worldview, than about the texts themselves. How is that? Well. It's a lot of times when we think about you know, the Western critical reading of hadiths, we think that Western scholars have these critical tools and ways of looking at sources that Muslim scholars didn't have. Right? That nowadays we have modern science, so we know that certain hadiths aren't true, and we have, you know, we've collected lots of different material, and we have a, a you know, modern way of, of, of criticizing historical sources, and this allows us to approach or analyze the authenticity of hadiths in a way that Muslim scholars didn't have. But, and this is, I, I mean, this is kind of a big claim, but I've, I think now I've seen enough evidence that I'm prepared to make the claim, and if I'm, if I'm wrong, then I'll adjust it, right? There is no hadith, everybody knows controversial hadiths. You know, how, what about the hadith that says, you know, um, the hadith of the fly push, pushing it into your drink, and there's the hadith of the sun, you know, going beneath the earth and prostrating before the throne of God and asking to get to rise again. Everyone has heard these hadiths, and people always talk about them and get debates, of, de debates over them over Eid dinner or whatever the Muslim equivalent of Thanksgiving dinner is. And they, they, we all know these. Not one of these hadiths, there is not one controversial hadith today that was not that was not also controversial a thousand years ago, and that Muslim scholars didn't actually identify the exact same question a thousand years ago, and find some satisfactory answer to it. So I want to repeat that because I'm not sure that I'm, I'm making as much sense as I want. There is no controversial hadith that you hear about that has not already been whether it's 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 1,300 years ago, has not been looked at by Muslim scholars, and they found exactly the same thing that bothers you. 
Why, why is this important? Because what's the difference then between, let's say, me when I think a hadith is controversial and I don't like it and I refuse to accept it and I say this is, this is nonsense, I can't accept this, I don't want this to be part of my religion. What's the difference between me and that scholar a thousand years ago? It's not about our, something in the hadith or some critical faculty that I have that this classical Muslim scholar didn't have because we both found exactly the same problems. The issue is what we do with that understanding. That's the difference. It's how we react to it. The big difference between the reaction that Muslims today have to controversial hadiths and the reaction that classical Muslim scholars had is the difference in our worldviews, the difference in what we expect from religion, what we th how we think religion should look and smell and feel. And guess where those differences come from? They don't come from the Islamic tradition. They come from the fact that as communities that live in the West or maybe came from areas that lived under Western colonization and Western educational systems, we've actually adopted many ideas into our own understanding of religion. They have no original uh, existence in the Islamic tradition. So, for example, uh, when, when I tell you a hadith, this is in Sahih Bukhari and other books, where uh, uh, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, says to Abu Dhar, his companion, do you know where this sun goes after it sets, O Abu Dhar? And Abu Dhar says, God and his prophet are more knowledgeable. Tell me. And the prophet says, the, the, the sun goes below, it goes down and it prostrates before the throne of God. It prostrates before the throne of Rahman and it asks his permission to rise again. And one day it will rise from the west. Now, it's very interesting. You see in the, in the early 20th century, Muslim scholars who are kind of modernist scholars start reacting very strongly to this hadith. This hadith contradicts astronomy, and this hadith contradicts the certainties of modern science because you know, nowadays we know that the earth actually goes around the sun and not vice versa, and classical Muslims didn't know that, and that's why they accepted this hadith. So we need to go back through the hadiths and analyze them to see uh, which ones are scientifically impossible and which ones are acceptable. This was a big debate, and this is, we still have this debate today. Guess what? Classical Muslim scholars, going back to the 10 hundreds, said exactly the same thing. Because if you're a Muslim scholar, one of the things you do before you have you know, clocks on your phone and everything is to calculate prayer times. I'm living in a place I need to tell people what time the prayers are. And what they found very quickly is that prayer times differ based on you know, latitude and longitude. And they knew that the sun was always up in certain places. Like, you can go to certain parts of the earth where the sun is, never sets. So they looked at this hadith, and they said, well, what, how do we understand it then? Oh, it must mean that the, uh, the sun prostrates to God metaphorically. Like in Surah Al-Rahman, you know, Najmu wa Shajaru Yasjudan, right? The stars and the trees they prostrate to God. It doesn't mean literally the star is you know, doing little sujood up in the sky. It means it's, it's surrendering to God's will. It follows God's will. So they had no problem. They just said, oh, this hadith is obviously figurative. And that was exactly the same criticism that these modern Muslim scholars are making. Exactly the same. They identified the fact that the sun does not actually go under the earth and disappear. It's always above the earth somewhere. So what's the difference then between modern scholar, this modern Muslim scholar and classical ones? It's not about whether or not they're critical or whether or not they're scientific, or whether or not they're willing to question hadiths. They all are. All classical Muslim scholars were always very happy to question hadiths. It's how much weight they gave to notions of truth outside of their religion, outside of the text, the scripture of their religion. So in the you know, modern period, 
part of modernity is the idea that truth doesn't exist within a religious tradition. Religions don't have monopoly on truth. Any one religion doesn't have a monopoly on truth. There's no scripture that contains truth. Rather, the, the modern approach uh, in the West is that scriptures are all actually doctored. You know, they're all the product of uh, kind of conspiracies to, to uh, attribute certain human writings to a divine source. So once, in the Western tradition, once people came up with that conclusion, they immediately became suspect of things like the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and they were very, anytime they saw anything in those texts that seemed to contradict you know, new scientific discoveries or anything like that, they immediately considered this to be a fault in the text of the scripture for them. They immediately considered this to be a, uh, another piece of evidence that their scripture was actually manufactured by human hands and was not really suitable to, to be the carrier of truth for a civilization. So when, what's the, the, the difference between that approach and the classical Islamic approach was classical Muslim scholars, they believed that the Quran contained the truth. They believed that the message of the Prophet, salam, if it's preserved accurately, it also uh, contains truth. And that anything outside the scriptures that's true must be able to, re can be reconciled with the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. So that's why you never ever find, I can't think of a single example, I may be wrong, but I can't think of a single example of a Muslim scholar before, let's say, 1890, who has ever, ever gotten into any trouble for scientific discoveries that I can think of. They got in trouble for being philosophers, for having mystical ideas that other ulama considered to be problematic, but they never ever got in trouble for scientific discoveries. Because it was assumed, it was assumed that anything you discovered empirically around you in the world had to be congruent with the truth of scripture. There had to be some way to understand them. So if you discover that the sun actually doesn't go below the earth, and disappear from human sight, that it's actually always up somewhere in the world, then what do you do with that hadith I just told you about? You, you just interpret it figuratively. You just interpret it figuratively. So one of the, 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 the major, when, when I said before that Muslim scholars were always willing to be critical of hadiths, a lot of Muslims are surprised by this. They think that uh, the hadith tradition is kind of this um, gullible, fideistic, uncritical approach to scripture, where Muslim scholars, they just look at who's in the asnad of the hadith and what's the chain of transmission for the hadith, and they don't want to use their brains, they don't want to look critically at the, the contents of the hadith. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. In fact, there is, not, there is no kind of modern criticism of the contents of a hadith. There is no type of criticism that I've come across in the modern world of the contents of hadith that does not have precedent amongst Muslims. And I don't just mean, you don't have to go and you know, find the Mu'tazilites and how you know, Muslim rationalists, so even Sunni scholars, even Sunni scholars who nowadays are seen as the kind of arch you know, proto-Salafis like Shams al-Din al-Dahabi or Ahmed ibn Hanbal or, or Bukhari, these scholars who are often seen as the, the archetypal kind of I don't want to say sort of insulting word, but kind of brainless Hadith scholar. These were actually the most, uh, oftentimes the most critical of the contents of Hadith. So there's one Hadith in, uh, it's actually in the Sunan of a Tirmidhi, where the, one of the companions describes the Prophet, salam, that one day he came out of his house and he had two books, one in each hand. And in these books was written all the names of all the people, all the human beings from the beginning of time till the end of time, you know, what tribe they're from, where they lived, and whether they're going to go to heaven or hell. So what does a Dhahabi, and anybody who knows anything about a, a, the famous scholar Shamsuddin al Dhahabi knows this person, he hates logic, he hates philosophy, he hates these asharis with their kalam, he hates anybody who's trying to use their brain too much, he doesn't like them. What does he say about this hadith? He says, this is impossible, 
because these books would be so big that no human being could possibly carry them. You'd have to have like donkeys, you know, a mule train or something to carry these books with you. So he rejects the hadith. But why is it that, why is it that then it's very rare that we see classical Muslim scholars engaging in the kind of criticism I did? Why, you know, they might find a problem with the hadith, like the, the hadith of the sun uh, prostrating before the throne of God. They might look at it and say, hmm, I don't understand this. This seems to be problematic to me. Why is it that they don't just throw it out like a lot of modern people do? Because their worldview, the place they came from, was a worldview of humility, of deference to, to God, of acceptance of prophecy, and acceptance of the presence of a prophetic message in the world. So they, what's very interesting about Muslim scholars in the pre-modern period, they wanted to believe hadiths. They wanted to believe hadiths. If you could come up with any decent argument why this hadith was reliable, they wanted to accept it. They wanted more information that might be traceable back to the Prophet. They wanted more connections to the Prophet. Whereas today, you know, Muslims, uh, you know, they're reacting to the world around them. They're reacting to the environment around them. And this environment, it's an environment that wants the world to be disenchanted, you know, wants a disenchanted world, wants a world that's emptied of God, wants a world where, you know, if you believe in God, you just believe that he created the world and it runs like a watch and there's no, there's no miracles, there's nothing that can ever change in the world that's just totally material. They don't want the prophetic presence interfering in their lives. They don't want to find something, a, a, a statement from the prophet that can give them guidance, that might have wisdom for them. And you see this so often, so often, especially with hadith dealing with gender. And I know this is a controversial topic. One of the, one of the things that I was doing research on for this book that I'm, I'm almost done with now, is you know these hadiths that talk about whether or not there's, you know, that there's more uh, women in hellfire than men? Do you know that actually, the f in the chapter of Sahih Muslim that deals with this issue, the first report in that chapter is an opinion of Abu Huraira. It's not a had prophetic hadith, it's an opinion of Abu Huraira. And a group of Muslims in Medina, this is after the death of the Prophet, والسلام, a group of Muslims in Medina are debating whether or not there's more women or men in heaven. And Abu Huraira says, they come to him and they ask him what his opinion is. And he thinks and he says, there's more women in heaven. Why? Because the Prophet said that this group of people who enter heaven, uh, each man will have two wives. Therefore, there's more women than men in heaven. Right? And then you see, wait, but there's other hadiths where the Prophet says, والسلام, says that the women are the smallest number of people in heaven. Men are the greater number. And this is very interesting. What does a great scholar like Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who's a famous, probably the most famous kind of medieval Hadith scholar. He's from Cairo. He died in uh, 1449. He says, this person narrating this Hadith probably made a mistake because this person thinks that if there is more women in hell, there have to be less women in heaven. Whereas if women are the majority of mankind, Ibn Hajar says, if women are the majority of mankind, then even if you have exactly half of all men going to hell and exactly half of all men going to heaven and exactly half of all women going to hell and exactly half of all women going to heaven, you still have more women in both heaven and hell. And so this is, he says, this is my explanation for these hadiths. He's very flexible. And in fact, Muslim scholars were always very flexible when they were dealing with these issues because they knew they were dealing with the realm of the unseen, the afterlife, which we, none of us can, can ever possibly understand. That's why they would always use the famous saying of the companion Ibn Abbas, لَيْسَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مِمَّا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا الْأَسْمَاء There's nothing in this world that's in the next world except names. The only thing we know in common is names. We can't possibly understand the details or the exact nature of the afterlife. But why is this important? Because this is the kind of things that Muslims become obsessed with when they find these hadiths. Oh, the Prophet, you know, this is a misogynist hadith. This is a sexist hadith. No, it's not, because the very people, not only the, the, the companions of the Prophet, but generations and generations of Muslim scholars after them 
never thought this was saying that actually there are more women in hellfire than men. They never interpreted it like that. As I said, most of them actually believe that there are more women in heaven than men. What were they interested in? They were interested in the wisdom that the second part of all these hadiths, no one ever talks about the second parts of the hadiths, right, where uh, the prophet says to the women he's talking to, he's, he's trying to give them lessons to help them improve their lives. So he says, you know, you, you're women, you're cursing a lot, and you're uh, being ungrateful to your husband. And he continues and he says, what is ungrateful? It means your husband does, is always good to you, but then one day he doesn't do something good for you, and you say to him, I've never seen anything good from you. And this is a very interesting phrase. I think maybe people in the room have heard the phrase before, right? It's possible. It's very good advice the Prophet is giving these women. They thought, so I'm just saying, be grateful when, you're, when you have a good husband. And then in other hadiths, he gives advice to men. And yet we still are obsessed with these, with our own, because of our, the, the, the worldview from which we come, we're obsessed with reading these hadiths through this kind of, what sometimes people call a hermeneutic of suspicion. We look at these hadiths and we're suspicious of them. These are sexist hadiths. Like the famous hadith that says that, a woman was created from a bent rib, and if you try to straighten her out, you'll break her. So you have to enjoy her as she is. If you try to straighten out and breaking her, you'll be divorced from her. Who is, people look at this, oh, this is sexist. But why is it that we jump to that conclusion? We should actually just look at the meaning of the hadith first. Because, I, and the reason I thought about this is because I was, you know, before I got married, I was reading this, you know, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus book that everyone was telling me I had to read. And what was it saying? It was saying, uh, don't uh, try to solve your wife's problems for her. Don't expect her to be like you. You have to accept her for as she is. Don't expect her to change. You just have to be there for her. And, you know, and sometimes she's going to do things that don't make sense. You have to accept that this is because men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? And then I realized when I read this hadith, this is exactly the same message. Here it's talking to men. It's saying, men, and I guarantee you, if you get all the men in this conference in one room, they'll all start talking about how, I wish my wife were more reasonable. Why doesn't she just think like I do? Why doesn't she just see it this way? And that, if, if, if men sit around like this all the time, they're going to be miserable. And they're going to end up with miserable marriages. Because you're never going to get your spouse to be exactly like you. You're never going to be able to straighten her out to be like you. You have to accept her for the person she is. And then, if you do that, you can have a happy life together. So, I, what, the reason I thought of this when I was reading this book on you know, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, I realized this is the same message in the Hadith. But no one had ever, you know, actually there are some scholars like Javed Ahmed Ghamdi have actually interpreted the Hadith as, as such. But when, when you see on you know, discussion lists or when Muslims get together or when there's a conference and some speaker comes and talks about hadith, there's always someone who gets up in the audience and says, but you know, brother, what about the hadith of the, the crooked rib and isn't this sexist? Why is it that we always jump on that band bandwagon? Why don't we stop and say, maybe the Prophet actually has teachings, has wisdom to offer us. And maybe it's actually talking to men in this case and telling men that they have to change the way that they look at their marriages and their relationships. So these, uh, when we, th when we are, are confronted with issues about hadith, and we often are, Muslims are always confronted with hadith that seem bizarre or unusual or that they, they reject or that they can't accept as part of their religion or that seems stupid or vulgar, right? Let, ask yourself, where is the problem here? Is the problem really in the hadith? Or is the problem with, my, with me? Why am I jumping to the conclusion I do? Why am I reading the hadith in the way I do? Why, am I, why aren't I willing to look at other interpretations that might, be, that might actually find something valuable in this hadith? I think oftentimes, when Muslims have a skeptical or you know, suspicious approach to hadith, it's because they've adopted a skeptical and suspicious approach to religion, really. And that they need to look in their hearts and ask themselves, 
whether they really want a world that's full of God, a world with a prophetic presence in it. Because if you do, if you want to look for the wisdom in the prophet's legacy, then you can, you'll, you'll, you'll take on more of the mindset of those classical Muslim scholars. And it's not uncritical, it's not irrational, it's not fideistic or simplistic. Those classical Muslim scholars were just as smart, just as critical, oftentimes just as scientifically aware as we are today. So, you know, when you look at these things, remember the words of Yoda, that oftentimes what you're finding there, what you're objecting to, is really what you've taken with you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.